unfortunately, for, uh, I got a, some things at the top I definitely want to hit. So bear with me. There's lots of different topics. Uh, on onboarding of personnel, this morning uh, the secretary swore in two new undersecretaries of defense uh, right upstairs, uh, Michael McCord as the undersecretary of defense comptroller and Ronald Moultrie as the undersecretary of defense for intelligence and security. Both were confirmed, I think you know, by the Senate last week. And today we also onboarded Mela Louise Norman as the deputy chief of staff to the secretary. That brings our total to 119 DOD appointees onboarded since January 20th. And it also fills 12 of the department's 61 political appointments. And we look forward to continuing to work uh, with Congress to confirm President Biden's uh, nominations and to continue to flesh out the team here. We're grateful for the service of these individuals uh, and for their willingness uh, to come uh, into government um, to do this very important work. Uh, today, as I think you know, kicks off Pride Month. The Secretary is very proud to celebrate and honor the service, commitment, and sacrifice of our LGBTQ personnel in and out of uniform. Uh, he's proud that one of his first actions after being sworn in was to implement President Biden's directive to ensure that all transgender individuals who wish to serve and who can meet the appropriate standards should be able to do so openly and free from discrimination. At the direction of Secretary Austin, the department has also taken concerted action to promote and protect the human rights of LGBTQ persons around the globe. The Secretary remains committed to, of course, building a diverse, equitable, and inclusive force. Uh, and over the course of the month, the department will celebrate the rich contributions of LGBTQ personnel. Um, on schedule this Thursday, the Secretary will host Israeli Minister of Defense Benjamin Gantz uh, for his first counterpart visit uh, here in person at the Pentagon. Uh, we'll have more detail as we get closer to Thursday and, uh, uh, and be able to provide that to you uh, later on. Um, on exercises, Defender Europe 21 continues. Um, as part of a series of field artillery exercises called Fire Shock, the U.S. Army's 41st Field Artillery Brigade joined Exercise Sabre Guardian, um, and the unit quickly deployed to Bulgaria, conducted a live fire, and returned to their home station in Germany. Uh, and the Defender Europe 21 Command Post exercise began today as well. This exercise includes approximately 2,000 personnel and, and will demonstrate the ability to command multinational forces in a joint and combined training environment. Formidable Shield 21 wraps up this week, also part of Defender uh, Europe. The NATO and air missile exercise began on the 15th of May. Formidable Shield exhibits allied interoperability in a live fire joint environment using NATO command and control reporting structures. The exercise sponsored by the Navy Sixth Fleet and conducted by Naval Striking and Support Forces, Support Forces NATO remains underway on the Western Isles of Scotland uh, and off Norway and in the North Atlantic. 15 ships, nearly 50 aircraft, and more than 3,000 service members from 10 nations are participating. Uh, in other UCOM news, European Command news, uh, yesterday as part of a bomber task force rotation, U.S. Air Force strategic aircraft conducted Operation Allied Sky by flying over every NATO allied nation in Europe in a single day. B-52H Stratofortress aircraft currently deployed to Marone Air Base in Spain, integrated with several allied aircraft during the operation. And while we're talking about NATO today, the Secretary participated virtually in uh, a NATO defense ministerial uh, hosted by the Secretary General, General uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg. Uh, Alliance defense leaders met to prepare for the June 14th NATO summit and focused on strengthening the alliance's deterrence and defense. We'll have a much more detailed readout. That meeting just wrapped up uh, within the last hour or so, so we'll have a more detailed readout for you later on this afternoon. And finally, in some, uh, to, to note some sad news uh, that I know you are all familiar with, uh, we here at the Pentagon would like to take a moment to, uh, to express our condolences and our sympathies for the passing of Mr. Tejinder Singh, uh, who many of you know was the founder and editor of India America Today. He was a Pentagon correspondent since 2011, and I d dealt with him from this podium, and I've dealt with him uh, when I was at the State Department podium, um, and the one word... I mean, the one word that comes to mind when you think of Tejinder is gentleman. He was a real gentleman. Good reporter, damn good reporter. Asked tough questions uh, and, uh, and produced good stuff. But, uh, but he was a heck of a man uh, and, and, a, and a gentleman, as I said, and uh, we're going to miss him. We're all going to miss him. I know you guys feel the same way. 
Okay, well, that's a sad note uh, to end the toppers, but uh, I thought it was important to say, so we'll uh, get the questions. Lita. Hi, thanks, John. Um, two quick things. One, you mentioned uh, Minister Gantz uh, coming in. Um, is, I saw something. Is this going to be largely about Iran? Can you provide any other sort of guidance on some of the things that they may be talking about? And then just a, a quick other thing. Um, do you know uh, the Secretary has gotten the, um, the I guess, memos from the services on the sec their thoughts on the sexual assault um, prosecution changes. Can you talk about when we might see or hear something from the Secretary on that? Thank you. Yeah, Lita, can I ask you to repeat your first question? Because it was garbled and I didn't get it. Sure, no problem. Um, so, uh, Minister Gantz coming in later this week. Um, can you provide any other details on um, whether they're going to be talking about Iran or other issues? Um, just any other uh, details you might be able to provide us at this point. Okay, thanks. That's much clearer. I got you that time. So on uh, Minister Gantz, I certainly won't get ahead of the agenda of the meeting. Um, I, I, uh, I think it's safe to expect that among the things they will talk about uh, are regional security issues, and clearly uh, we have every expectation that Iran and their malign behavior in the region will certainly come up. Um, this is obviously uh, not the first time that uh, the Secretary has met or spoken with Minister Gantz. They've had n numerous phone calls, which we've all read out to you uh, over the last couple of weeks with, with respect to Gaza. And of course, uh, we visited Israel n not too long ago, and they had a very extensive day together. So uh, this, we expect uh, Thursday's meeting will be a continuation of those discussions, but clearly regional security issues will be at the top of the list. And as for the um, recommendations of the Independent Review Commission uh, and the services reaction to those, yes, I, I, I don't think you asked this, but to confirm the services have uh, uh, reported back to the secretary uh, about their views on the initial set of recommendations that were in the uh, accountability line of effort. Um, uh, the secretary is reviewing uh, that feedback. Again, I won't get ahead of, of him or his thinking on this, uh, but he, as he has said many times to all of you, he wants to make sure we get this right, and he wants to make sure he's keeping an open mind. Uh, and he certainly wants to make sure that whatever decisions he makes uh, on these recommendations, that it is well informed by the services and the, and the military departments. Uh, and so that's where we are literally this week. I mean, we, he, they, they were uh, all turned in uh, uh, last week, and, uh, and he's reviewing them. And, you know, if and when we've got more to report out on this, certainly we will. Okay, here in the room, Carla. Thanks. Um, two questions. The first one on the Iranian naval ships that appear to be heading towards Venezuela. What more can you give um, on that? Uh, do you know any more details on where they're going or what they're planning? And then uh, also on Afghanistan, AFP is reporting that Bagram Air Base is going to be handed over to the Afghans in about 20 days this month. Can you confirm that? Uh, on, um, uh, I've seen the press report on Bagram. I'm obviously not going to get ahead of specific retrograde milestones. I mean, clearly, uh, Bagram Air Base will be turned over as part of this process. Uh, but I'm not going to speculate about timing and, and get ahead of that for obvious operational security uh, purposes. And as for, uh, you know, the, your question uh, on this uh, Iranian ship, uh, I, I would, I, I would point you to the Iranians to speak to their naval deployments and uh, what it is they, they're doing and, uh, and the, what it is they're trying to accomplish. I, I, I won't speak to those, those matters from the podium. But you can confirm that there are two naval ships. I, I'm not going to confirm. I, I won't confirm. I mean, I, I don't even get into talking about, <laughs> uh, you know, ongoing operations of the U.S. military, the U.S. Navy, uh, unless it's an exercise like I, I, I topped out at the beginning there. But I, I won't get into speaking for another nation's uh, naval deployments, that's really for them to speak to. Okay. Laura. Um, General Michael Flynn appeared to endorse a Myanmar-style military coup to reinstate President Trump. Can you tell us what your response is to that? I I've seen the uh, press reports on that, uh, Laura, um, and I've seen press reporting also that seemed to suggest he, um, that he was refuting 
uh, the, those comments. Um, I, I, the, the department's not going to have an official comment one way or on this. Mm -hmm. um, just as a different question, then um, we just reported that the, that the State Department is running a volunteer pilot program to get people's baseline health information before sending them overseas as part of the response to the Havana syndrome. Can you tell me if DOD is doing anything similar? I, I know of no similar uh, program here at, at DOD. And I haven't, I mean, again, that's all, that's a State Department thing to speak to, but I'm not, a, I'm not aware of any similar effort here at DOD. Let me go back to the phones. What is this? This is, this is Brooke's way of saying I screwed something up. <laughs> <laughs> this is out now? Yes, sir. Oh, okay, so Central Command has uh, released their uh, weekly update, and they estimate that they've completed between 30 to 44 percent of the entire retrograde process. Uh, they've retrograded the equivalent of approximately 300 C-17 loads of material out of Afghanistan and have turned nearly 13,000 pieces of equipment over to uh, the Defense Logistics Agency for disposition. So there you go. Thank you, Brooke. And I lost my complete place. What was I on? Oh, I was going to the phones, right? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, Matt Saylor, ABC. Hi, John. Thanks for doing this. Yes, sir. Um, a quick question on the, the coming UAP reports. Um, there's been some reporting that this could be coming as soon as this week or maybe even tomorrow. Can you say anything about what timing we should actually expect? The what report, Matt? UFO. Sorry, the UAP report, UFO report. Uh, that, that is uh, really for the DNI to speak to, Matt. As you know, this is a, a report, a, a congressionally mandated report. Uh, DNI is in the lead. Uh, it will be DNI who will be uh, making that report. Obviously, DOD has a role in helping um, uh, in, in helping flesh out the information that will be in that report. But as for specific timing, I'd refer you to the DNI. Yeah, Lucas. John, if China has the largest Navy in the world, why is the U.S. Navy cutting its fleet of warships? Uh, so, Lucas, I mean, uh, it, it's not about cutting. As a matter of fact, you'll see more ships uh, added into the fleet uh, going forward. Um, and... Uh, as the services have said, or as the Navy has said, and uh, certainly, certainly the, the Secretary agrees that, um, you know, the target of about 355 ships is about right going forward. Uh, and he supports that, that goal. Um, but you, we have, you know, we have global responsibilities, and we try to, to size and structure and build out a fleet that can meet our global responsibilities. It's not about uh, uh, trying to match uh, the, the numbers of any other particular Navy out there. It's about, as the Secretary has said many times, matching resources to strategy, strategy to the right policy, and policy to the will of the American people, and that's what we're focused on with the budget. You say you want 355 ships, but the Navy's top budget guru said that building eight ships a year is not going to get there. There's going to be, I mean, the, the Navy's working uh, a shipbuilding plan. I'm not going to get ahead of that. Uh, but, but, and I didn't, you know, as I said, the Secretary believes 355 is about right in terms of a, a long-term goal. Um, we, we'll have a shipbuilding plan that we'll submit officially to, to Congress. Uh, and, and, you know, we're going to need, obviously, support from members of Congress uh, to help us flesh that out, to build that fleet. It's also, Lucas, uh, important to remember that it, while the the, the number of ships certainly matter. What matters just as much is the right mix of capabilities that you have resident in that fleet. Uh, you could have a fleet of 355 tugboats, so you could literally say, I've got a 355 ship Navy, but that doesn't give you the kind of capabilities you're going to need to defend this country and to secure our national security interests around the world. So the right mix matters too, and that's where the Secretary wants to stay focused. Uh, let me go back here. Uh, Steve, is it Bayman? There's always this awkward pause as we wait to see who's muting. Okay, Steve, I'll try you a little bit later. Jennifer Steinhauer, New York Times. Hi, 
Hi. Um, thanks. That was um, quick. You, you no doubt know that some Republican lawmakers have been ta uh, attacking various efforts on the diversity inclusion front in the military, complaining about the stand down early order earlier this spring. Some have started a system on social media for active duty troops to file complaints about the so-called woke media military. What is your observation or, or comment on that? Well, these are m members of Congress, uh, Jennifer. We respect their uh, rights and their responsibilities. We certainly respect the, the oversight that uh, the Congress provides. Um, I'm, I'm not going to comment on any specific uh, one initiative that, that members of Congress uh, m might be doing. I think that's more appropriate for them to speak to. What I can speak to uh, is uh, what we're really focused on here at the department, and that's defending the nation. Um, and th that means putting in place uh, the right resources, uh, the right strategies, the right operational concepts to, 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 to do that around the world. Um, and that, you know, you saw, if you, you want an example of how seriously we're taking that, go back to Friday when we laid out the budget for you uh, and the kinds of capabilities, the kinds of systems that we're trying to purchase, acquire, modernize and improve to be able to defend this country from uh, from enemies and adversaries. Uh, and that's where the secretary's head is. Now, in order to do that, you need good people. Uh, the, 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 you, you can't, you, you, uh, warships, aircraft, systems, some of them can be unmanned, but most of them are manned right now. Most of them have crews. They have people servicing them, keeping them in the air, keeping them at sea. Um, and you need good people. Uh, and the secretary has been very clear and, and fairly unapologetic about the fact uh, that we want to get all the best talent that we can available from the American people. If you meet the standards uh, and you're, you're qualified to be in the military uh, and, and uh, you're, you're willing to raise your hand and serve this country, we want you to be able to do it. And we want you to be able to do it free of hate and fear and discrimination. Uh, we owe you that if you're going to uh, raise your right hand and volunteer to, to serve your country. That's the very least we can do. And there's no apologies for that. No apologies whatsoever uh, for wanting to create that kind of a working environment. And it is a work in progress. It's not the kind of thing that you can just say on one day and walk away. You got to keep focusing on it. It's about leadership. And it's about how you treat people and how people should be expected to be treated uh, when they, when they uh, wear the uniform of, of this country. So again, we're focused on defending this nation. Uh, that means the capabilities, the systems, the programs, the things you guys covered on Friday. But it also means the, the, the people, the sons and daughters that, uh, that American parents all throughout this country uh, are, are helping support and, uh, and helping encourage to, 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 come, uh, to come wear the uniform. Tara. Thanks, John. Um, yesterday, it was reported that uh, the UK is considering bringing as many th as 3,000 translators and their families uh, into the UK from Afghanistan. Is US talking to the UK about these plans? Um, has it affected at all US plans to maybe offer the same type of refuge to some of the interpreters that have helped our forces? I don't have an update on uh, uh, on the uh, what we're doing to uh, try to assist those who have helped us. But you heard the secretary speak to this, uh, as well as the chairman. Uh, uh, certainly when they testified last Thursday, uh, we know we have a special obligation to these individuals. We know the risks that they took on our behalf and are still taking on our behalf. Uh, and we're going to work inside an interagency process to meet those obligations. But as for specifics, uh, you know, we're still working our way through that interagency decision-making process uh, to see how this is going to be manifested. Uh, but again, it's a responsibility we take very seriously. We're working inside with the State Department and inside the interagency to come up with the best possible solutions. But isn't it quickly becoming too late? I mean, you yourself said that 44% of the stuff is out now. It'll get to a point where most of the troops are also out. At what point is it too late for these translators? I think we'd all understand uh, that there's uh, a sense of urgency here. Uh, and, and I think, well, I don't think, I, I know that the, the, the leaders inside the interagency are taking this very seriously and, and uh, moving on it as fast as we can. But we also need to make sure we do this right, uh, that it's safe, that it's effective, um, and, and that we've thought through all the possible contingencies here as we work through it. But everybody has a sense of urgency. Just one last on it. Uh, is this something where, you know, with NATO partners, you're actually talking about this specific issue and maybe coordinating the UK will take so many translators, US would take so many 
et cetera. Yeah, I'm not aware of discussions at that specific level uh, with our, our NATO counterparts that, you know, that would go to, the, to that idea. No, okay. I'm not aware of that. Christina. Thanks so much. Uh, some Asia-related questions. Uh, the Taiwanese Defense Ministry said uh, U.S. Special Forces are going over to Taiwan to train with their counterparts. Is that true? Is this, in, is this the first time? I don't have anything to, to comment on, on, that, uh, on that press report. Uh, the only thing I would add is, and we've said this before, we take our responsibilities seriously to help Taiwan defend itself in accordance with the Taiwan Relations Act. And secondly, how are uh, SecDef's efforts to communicate with General Xu Qilong, the uh, vice chair of the Central Military Commission in China? I don't have any updates on the secretary's schedule with respect to communications with counterparts in, in China. Okay, lastly, um, with the Ronald Reagan deploying to CENTCOM, does that send the wrong message to U.S. allies in the indo pacom region, leaving, you know, leaving the region without the aircraft carrier for up to four months? Well, without speaking to specific specific operations, uh, the, uh, the Secretary has made it very clear that we want to make sure that uh, General Miller has uh, the options he needs, the, the, the ability uh, to, to keep this a safe and orderly uh, withdrawal. And thus far it has been. And as the Secretary noted last week, it's actually moving ahead of schedule. Uh, that's got to be a prime focus, uh, that, uh, that as we bring our troops out of Afghanistan, we can do so safely. Um, and carriers are mobile assets. Uh, they don't need permission slips to operate in international waters, um, and they can move about f fairly nimbly in that regard. Uh, and um, there are ample, I would say, military capabilities in the Indo-Pacific region aside from the Ronald Reagan, uh, to meet our security commitments to our allies. Five of our seven treaty alliances are in the Pacific region, uh, as well as our commitments to other partners throughout, the, throughout that part of the world. And the Secretary's comfortable that uh, we will have and will always maintain uh, the capability to, to defend those national security interests in that part of the world. May I follow Christina's second question? Short time. Uh, he, he, thank you. She asked about communications with the Chinese counter, uh, Secretary of China. How is that set up? Uh, I was speaking earlier about the call with, say, Minister Gantz or someone coming over. I'm curious of how that's approved, uh, those calls, particularly in a conference like the Shangri-La Dialogue, which I know is canceled, where the, the ability to bump into a counterpart in a hallway or a meeting uh, <laughs> happens, as you know, and, and all of us know who have attended those. Who determines? You know, if indeed Secretary Austin can make a call or make a comment to a counterpart from Russia or China. Well, I mean, he's the Secretary of Defense. Um, and some. So he makes the decision. Sure. Sometimes uh, it's a conversation that he wants to have. Um, and uh, sometimes it's a conversation that an, a foreign counterpart wants to have with him. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a. a uh, a process that takes place to set those conversations up, and clearly um, uh, uh, we make sure that uh, we're keeping not only the appropriate uh, people here in the building informed uh, of those plans, but also uh, uh, the appropriate contacts at the National Security Council staff that, so that, that these a, conversations I mean, are so happening. So there's a coordinated... Of course there it's is. It's not done in a vacuum, so, so I know we're not talking about speculation here. We're talking about things that do happen, you know, at a conference, and. What happens if the minister of a country walks up to Secretary Austin? And, you know, this is, as you said last week, a planning agency, and you plan for contingencies. So if the contingency happens where a, another minister of defense walks up to Secretary Austin, he's permitted to speak to that person, even if, of if course. it's okay. Of course. But, I mean, the, 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 that, that happens all the time uh, on the sidelines of, of meetings where you'll have a chance encounter with somebody, and... Uh, um, uh, and if both individuals have time for a chat, then they'll then they'll have a chat. Okay, thanks. I mean, uh, but I thought you were talking about, you know, actual phone calls or pre-scheduled no, meetings. I understand the, the phone calls. Are, I understand that part of it. I'm talking about you know the, the who has the final authority. In other words, Secretary Austin is not going to just pick up the phone one day and call somebody. I'm sure that that's discussed ahead of time. The protocols. There's often good staff work that goes into preparing him for uh, these kind of counterpart visits and counterpart uh, uh, phone conversations. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to the phones here. Um, let's see. Uh, Sam Legrone. 
Hey, John. Um, following up on the uh, Iranian ship, uh, we published uh, satellite imagery um, about an uh, hour and a half ago showing the Iranian uh, expeditionary sea base had seven, uh, what appeared to be seven fast attack gro uh, boats aboard, missile fast attack boats like used by the uh, IRGCN. And then on Monday, the Iranians made it pretty clear um, that their uh, two ships were headed for Venezuela. So it appears that at the very least, uh, the Iranians are going to be drilling with um, the Venezuelans, if not selling them these fast attack boats. Uh, what would drills or sales of Iranian weapons to Venezuela uh, do towards uh, the U.S. Uh, Defense Department's posture in, uh, in Southcom and, you know, would it be a destabilizing influence? Thank you. Uh, Sam, I'm not going to speculate about what the Iranian uh, Navy might or might not do um, uh, with other navies uh, in a bilateral way. Um, I, so I, 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 I take, take your point. I haven't seen your story or your photographs. I'm clearly not going to talk about intelligence matters, and I'm not going to speak for the Iranian um, uh, Navy. Uh, we obviously take our responsibilities uh, in uh, the Southern Command area of responsibility very seriously. Um, and Admiral Fowler has at his disposal, as, 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 ah, try this again with English, at his disposal uh, capabilities uh, uh, to help secure our interests and to meet our commitments uh, in that part of the world. And I think I'd leave it at that. So, um. NSA, which is a military agency. Um, this is your way of saying, Kirby, you have to answer this question. <laughs> you cannot punt on this one. <laughs> well done. NSA spied on the French and German governments for years using uh, Danish underwater uh, cables. And the French government and the German government are demanding explanations to uh, U.S. Do you have any explanation to give them? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to talk about intelligence matters. Okay. Uh, we value our allies uh, very, very deeply, um, and I'm not going to speak to these press reports, uh, and I'm certainly not going to get into intelligence issues. Yeah, it's not press report. It's uh, the French president not, and the German uh, chancellor. Uh, I, I know. I've seen the press reports of their comments. I'm not going to speak to intelligence matters. Okay. I have another question. Uh, I don't know if you saw the press reports uh, last uh, week about um, the U.S. troops uh, charged with guarding uh, nuclear weapons in Europe. And uh, they were um, trying to memorize the location of the live nuclear weapons using flashcards, mm -hmm. according to the um, investigative uh, site Bellingcat, which is very knowledgeable and serious. Yeah. So do you have any comment on that? What I would tell you is that the Department of the Air Force is investigating the suitability of information shared via study flashcards. Um, for security reasons, I think you know, uh, we don't discuss past or current security protocols. Uh, all U.S. weapons are safe and secure. Um, and I think, as you also know, it's U.S. policy not to neither confirm or deny the presence or absence of nuclear weapons at any specific location. Okay. So an investigation is there? By the Air Force, yes. Thanks. Okay. On the phones, uh, Jeff Shogel. Uh, thank you. Following up on my colleague's question, uh, retired General Flynn has uh, argued for overthrowing the Democratic government. Will the Defense Department recall him to service and court-martial him for treason? Uh, Jeff, I, have, I know of no such plans to do so. Is it within the Defense Department's ability? I mean, uh, uh, without speaking to this specific case, uh, retired uh, officers uh, can uh, uh, be... Uh, brought back onto uh, active duty to face uh, disciplinary uh, charges if it's uh, warranted. It's very, very rare. And again, I'm not aware of any uh, effort or interest uh, in, in doing it in this case. Yeah, Jenny. Thank you, Don. Um, I have a question about the United States defensive uh, role for the South Korea. How will the end of um, the missile guidelines on the South Korea affect the U.S. defense law for the South Korea? Will there be any change to the U.S. 
lower for the defense, lower for the I'm not aware of any changes, Jenny. Uh, 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 nothing about this changes the alliance between South Korea and the United States or our commitments to that alliance, which, as you know, is a defensive alliance. Mm -hmm. But any, uh, you have any schedule to uh, reduce the you know, defense role for the South Korea because of uh, you uh, lift to the missile guidelines that they again have? I know of no such changes in the offing. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Barb, did you have your hand up? I did. I wanted to follow up on a couple of things. Um, on Iranian uh, weapons, without addressing this particular ship that lots of people appear to be tracking, what you didn't address is what is U.S. policy about allowing the presence of Iranian missiles or weapons in this hemisphere? And I was mystified by your answer that Southcom has a capability because they don't maintain a standing anti-missile capability. They request assets when they need them. So what actually is the policy about allowing Iranian weapons in this hemisphere. Well, I, maybe I was inarticulate. What I meant to say was that the Southern Command uh, certainly has the ability to look after our interests in that part of the world. They are different needs and different interests in that part of the world than they are perhaps in Central Command or in the uh, Indo-Pacific. Um, and I'm not aware of a specific uh, policy regarding this potential reported eventuality. I don't want to get into... I'm not asking about that. I'm asking about what is the U.S. government's willingness to allow Iranian <coughs> weapons in this hemisphere? I don't... I don't... Uh, I'd have to take the question, Barb. I have to oh. take the question. And can I also ask, going back to trans, the question on uh, translators, Afghans that need to get out of the country, you and the secretary uh, and the chairman have now all publicly talked about it. You said that it was, there was some urgency and planning, but yet the White House hasn't said that. So um, is it sort of time to just say publicly that, yes, you're going to do it? Because the secretary and the chairman appear very much to be saying that, even though the White House hasn't. By it, I th you're referring uh, to have evacuations. A program, have a program to help Afghans get out of Afghanistan if they feel they're in danger from the Taliban? I, I think we've all been consistent here, Barb. Uh, the focus right now is on the special immigrant visa program, and that is the purview of the State Department. Everybody shares a sense of obligation to those who have helped us for so long. We are a planning organization. We plan for all manner of contingencies um, uh, to include non-combatant evacuation operations around the world, uh, and that would include Afghanistan. But, but there has been no tasking to do that. Uh, and as I said last week, if we are so tasked, if that is so ordered, the Department of Defense would be capable of doing it and doing it effectively. And the very last follow-up, and I hesitate to be asking this, but on the unmanned aerial phenomenon report, because you said, because many of these site reported sightings have been from military personnel, and because you said that DOD is assisting with this effort, can you tell us anything about what you have been able to rule out? Have you been able to rule out the science fiction scenario of any kind of life form? Is this mechanical phenomena? Is this uh, perhaps atmospheric? Can you, can you just say for people who are interested that you have ruled out there's any life forms out there? Uh, I would be getting ahead of a report that hasn't been submitted to Congress yet, and that's never a good idea for a spokesman in this town. So I don't want to get ahead of the report. We'll, uh, uh, and I refer you to DNI to There's speak to that. that. You can rule out at uh, this point. I am not going to get ahead of a report that this agency is not writing uh, in response to a congressional mandate. Um, that I would refer you to DNI for for more detail about that. Thanks. I think I've got time for one more, and I apologize for the, the time crunch today, but um, I do have to get going here. Uh, Paul Shankman from U.S. News. Hi, John. Two questions, please. Um, Moderna this morning, this morning applied for full FDA clearance for its coronavirus vaccine. Are there any plans in place now for making that, max, that vaccine mandatory if it's approved? And how does that proceed 
if and when it is in fact approved. Uh, I know of no plans to make the vaccine, that vaccine or any of the others that we're using uh, mandatory. Uh, and I think as you saw from the briefing we gave a week or so ago, uh, our, uh, our uh, acceptance numbers are actually uh, high and consistent with uh, the American population. So I don't have anything um, to, to speak to with respect to the possibilities of making it mandatory. There are no plans to do that right now. And then one last question on the Pentagon's contributions to the UFO report. I've been speaking with a series of experts abroad who have expressed some concern about similar investigations in other countries having too much of a military focus and not enough input from civilian scientists. I wonder if that's a concern that the Pentagon has shared and whether that came up at all during this most recent review process. Uh, we're participating in a DNI-led um, uh, uh, study, uh, uh, again, on uh, mandated by Congress, uh, we're providing uh, context and information um, uh, that we have uh, on these uh, phenomena, and, and our focus is on again on supporting uh, the DNI's efforts to produce this report. Uh, that's that's where our, our focus is, and uh, and and again, that's our that's our lane, that's our place to be in, is to provide uh, the kind of context that we have and the information that we have uh, to help uh, the DNI. Uh, produce this report for Congress. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, Ma'am, you've been very patient. I'll take one more. I know I've got to get out of here, but you've been very patient. Which yes, I'll, uh, I'll follow up on the Israeli Defense Minister visit on Thursday. Yes. Is it upon an invitation from Washington? Yes. Yeah. Was it a plan before, or it came? No, it was, uh, I think I think the secretary and Minister Gantz talked about this. Uh, they, actually, the secretary extended an invitation to Minister Gantz to visit D.C. At the, on the, the first time that they spoke um, after he uh, took office, um, and then COVID just did not permit this. Uh, the issue of a visit to D.C. came up again when we were in Israel uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the secretary again reiterated uh, his invitation. And uh, uh, in the context of the many conversations that they've had over the last couple of weeks, it was again discussed. And uh, so, yes, he's coming at the invitation of the secretary. So it's not related to the Israeli prime minister's statement earlier today that he will do everything to eliminate a nuclear threat, even in the cost of uh, a break with the United States. No, the, no, I, I can assure you the, uh, the, the specifics of this visit uh, for this week, uh, the, the idea of it was discussed months ago. And last week when the secretary and the minister spoke again, um, they were able to sort of round out a, a day. But this, this, uh, the, the visit that I'm talking about today, that I'm announcing today, has nothing to do with comments made today uh, in, in Israel. This was something that the secretary and minister Gantz have been talking about for quite some time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Sorry, I got a rush.